Hello, my name is Peter, and welcome to Crushing Comics, and a show that I like to call Haul Around the World. It is where I have a new Comics Collected Edition haul. It has come here, typically all the way from the United States, from my primary base of ordering in-stock trades, and it's here that I open them up. I already opened the Box of American Era, so I just have these bricks of comic books to run through with you. This was my May order. I ordered it May 21st. It's been here for a little while. Things do not take quite that long to get here, although pretty long. It's about 14 books, so we've got a lot of stuff to go in and take a look at. So if you haven't noticed in the past couple of hauls, epic collections are almost like the main trigger for me to make my orders because they come out with an amount of frequency and I'm not picking up new Marvel books anymore. I'm only picking up older collected editions. And since the epic collections are on such of a schedule that they pretty much come out every week, they're almost always in my order. It's almost the reason I've made the order, almost always. So this, this one actually is pretty cool. America, Captain America, the Bloodstone Hunt. And it's pretty cool because it has some of the first comics that I ever purchased in it, which is pretty exciting. Uh, let me see if I can find one of the covers. So we are pretty deep into the Mark Grinwald era of Cap here. I think this is like the third Grinwald Cap one, I want to say. It must be because we're into the 350s. And Bloodstone Hunt was a specific ongoing storyline. It was in six parts, and I never had all six parts as a kid, so I am pretty excited about having them now, and I cannot find the cover of the one that I had as a kid. So I don't know a whole heck of a lot about it other than that. Let's see who the illustrators were. Uh, Kieran Dwyer, Rich Buckler, Al Milgram, Mark Bright, Ron Lim, and Mark Bagley. So a couple of uh, significant ones in there. And, you know, all of these epics, my intention is to do like a from the beginning read, which with each of these as I get to going through them, whenever that's going to be. And it's like, this is my obsession in life. I love this idea that I'm going to take something and get all the way from the beginning, all the way to the end and like really learn it through and not skip anything and be complete. It's the way I listen to music. It's the way that I buy comic books. It's why I have all these X-Men comic books. And it's um, it's just like the way that my brain works. So that's it. That was an awful long time just talking about a cat book where I actually haven't read any of the issues that are in it. Uh, there's also an amazing Spider-Man epic collection. This is Epic Volume 3. And it is Amazing Spider-Man. Spider-Man No More collects Amazing Spider-Man 39 through 52 in Annual 3 and 4. So I actually, originally, I was really going to get Marvel Masterworks of, of Spider-Man. Like, when I first started buying collections, I was like, I'm going to do it. It's Spider-Man. His name is Peter, just like me. It's classic. I'm going to do it. And I, like, started looking, and even in the aftermarket, you know, they're, like, $50 to $80 each. And I hemmed and I hawed, and I started working on my X-Men Masterworks, and by the time I was ready for Spider-Man, it was just out of financial reach. Like, too many of them have gotten to be whales. There are too few of them that I could lay hands on. So I've kind of just been all this time being like, gosh darn it, I should have done that. You know, almost every time when I wait and don't buy something, I'm sorry later. Like, I've learned to just buy the thing. Um, it's very rare that I don't buy the thing, and then I'm like, I'm happy I didn't buy the thing. And Spider-Man Masterworks were one of those examples, except now I am finally happy I didn't buy the thing, because it's so much cheaper to pick them up in Epic Collections. The uh, cover price of this Epic Collection is $40. The cover price of a Marvel Masterworks is usually between $60 and $100, and this collects two Masterworks worth of material. So we've got a pretty good run of Spider-Man from the beginning. We've got three, I guess three, and then we've got a big, pretty big chunk in the 300s of Spider-Man and a few smattered, smattering, splat, splattering, smattering, scattering of other ones in the middle. Speaking of Marvel Masterworks Spider-Man though, I did go in for this line, which is Marvel Team Up. As I described on a recent... Oh, look at that. Dracula. I love Marvel Dracula. As I described on a recent episode, Marvel 2-in-1 was the Things team-up comic, and Marvel team-up team up was Spider-Man's team-up comic. In fact, there are a few times that he teams up with the human... or the Human Torch, rather, teams up rather than Spider-Man. So that's once, twice... Three times a torch in this one. Uh, but it's primarily Spider-Man's team-up title. And I don't know why I started getting this 
and not the other Spider-Man line. I guess I just felt like Marvel team up with something that they would never put in an omnibus because it's so many different creators, it's not one continuous story, it just doesn't have that prestige factor. And um, so many of these team-ups are significant team-ups that represented some of the only solo outings of these characters. Here we have Iceman, Brother Voodoo, well, Daredevil, Master of Kung Fu, Thor, Hulk, uh, Doc Savage, the Falcon. So that's really exciting to me. And they tend to be really good, fun, one-off stories that have like a um, cliffhanger page that just has the character in the next one and then it kind of boots you into the next one. So that's why I started buying them. And this one, uh, clearly the line had been hung up for a while because of Master of Kung Fu. Same reason as the two-in-one line we saw a few episodes ago. And this takes us 23 through 30. And this is a series that went over 100 on issue count. So I don't know if we're ever going to get there in Marvel Masterworks. And this is not even a really big one. They probably could have pushed it to be a little bit bigger. We've been definitely seeing some huge Masterworks lately. So could have been more. And I have another master working here. This is getting really exciting Defenders. This is volume six, so we're getting pretty deep. And look at that awesome Valkyrie action on the cover. We're getting pretty deep into Defenders. This is Defenders number 42 through 57, so we're past one-third of the way through Defenders in Marvel Masterworks. But Defenders has always also been collecting the backside pretty well in Epic Collections, so I suspect we're probably going to meet in the middle with Masterworks and Epic Collections and wind up with this title totally covered in reprints, we're getting pretty close. So this is a Defenders era that fe features Hulk pretty heavily and Valkyrie, but also this is uh, Hellcats on the team here, Doctor Strange, uh, what is that guy's name? Nighthawk? Some kind of hawk, some kind of night dude, I don't know. Here, you, maybe you can tell me. He's, he, es he escapes my knowledge. Again, Defenders, not something that I've read a whole lot of. I actually had a really fun conversation on, uh, pretty recently online where I said the founders of the Defenders included Silver Surfer. And the person I was talking to was like, that's bunk. It would, I would actually include Valkyrie. The other three, of course, being um, Namor, Doctor Strange, and Hulk. The thing is that the Defenders emerged from a storyline that included uh, Hulk, Doctor Strange, Silver Surfer, and Namor. But when they got into the Defenders together, Silver Surfer was nowhere to be found. They do find him in issues two and three, and then he's like, peace out. We see him a little bit for the first ten issues, and then he's really not a factor. Whereas Hulk, Doctor Strange, and Namor, and very much Valkyrie, become part of the enduring brand of the Defenders. So why do I still associate Silver Surfer with Defenders? Because all of the Defenders reboots that we've seen over the years from Marvel, especially in the 2000s, they all include Silver Surfer. So they've kind of made it canonical that Silver Surfer is a part of the group, even though in the long 152 issue history of the original title, he's not really in it all that much. Next, I have something that maybe you would not expect. Maybe, do I have two volumes of this in this order? Let's just get them both out at once. Yes. Um, so we all know that I love Wildstorm which was Jim Lee's image imprint that launched in 1992. But I really have a great affinity for all of the original image imprints, with the exception of Eric Larson's imprint. I forget what it's called, but it's the one with Savage Dragon. Because I never, I just never liked Savage Dragon. I never really liked Eric Larson. Like, no, no shade. I just wasn't my fave of the five of them. So after I completed my everything Wildstorm, which I'm still trying to figure out how to bring to you on this channel, um, I also basically went through some of the other ones and said, are any of these really easy to get everything? So I wound up getting all of Jim Valentino's books um, that was Shadowhawk, and I I also wound up picking up a lot of Jim Leafield's Extreme Comics, which became Mass Maximum Press later. Now, I skipped a few things, including Evangeline, that I probably could have collected, and now I'm kind of like, oh, you moron. Because, again, always buy the thing when you think you should buy it. Then they announced some big media deal, and all of a sudden, all of these, like, issues that were 25 cents each, and I passed up, became, like, $5 issues. Oh, well. So, um, but, so Youngblood has been re... was his main line, and it's been... Um, relaunched a handful of times, and it's one of those ones where, like, it relaunches and it kind of, like, has new continuity, but sometimes it makes reference to the old continuity, and so I, since I have all of it, except for this one that I can't track down from, like, a convention or something, I thought, oh, well, these are so cheap. They were $9.99 each, and then an IST, of course, has them much cheaper, that I would pick them up. So this is, gosh, when did it come out? I've noticed lately that I tend to like be down here when I answer these questions. I want to like let you see the book while I'm answering them. I'm still trying to figure that out. This um, 
This was released in 2008, so it's actually not that new. It's 10 years old. Uh, and it's, but it's called the brand new Youngblood. So I have the first one here, which is Volume 1, Focus Tested, and then Volume 2, Voted Off the Island. It's a great picture of uh, President Obama on the front there. So I don't know anything about these other than uh, Joe Casey is the writer on them. And Joe Casey, I, you know, I don't always love him, but he writes some pretty marvelously weird stuff sometimes. And, uh, and so I couldn't pass it up to complete my collection. Now, let's see what else in the stack. Oh, some of these I think I can be pretty quick on. Okay, Black Magic which is Greg Rucka and Nicola Scott. Nicola Scott, one of the best illustrators in comic books. Other than Black Magic, she also did alternating issue in Greg Rucka's run on Wonder Woman and Rebirth. Her illustration is just incredible. Let me do a little tour for you here. Her figures just, it looks like almost photography. It also kind of reminds me of Jill Thompson in a way. But um, just with all of this like black ink wash, and part of the style in this book that's really cool is she tends to only do a color wash or a color spot when there's magic happening. So it's almost a black and white book. And the first volume of this is incredible. I'm absolutely going to rebuy this in hardcover. It's marvelous. It's gorgeous. It's, um, it's a very, it's like <sighs> X-Files from the perspective of a witch who is the detective Kind of, sort of, that's like a very off-the-cuff way of saying it, but I found it utterly thrilling. It was one of my favorite things that I read in the year the first collection came out. So I'm so excited to reread that one and then read this one. Maybe I'll spotlight it after I've caught up. Uh, this is a quick one, Avengers World. I realized when I was doing my Hickman Avengers read with Fangirl on this channel that I was somehow missing this one trade. Like, I own every single trade from Marvel now, except for this one. Uh, this is the material that comes after time runs out. So it's Avengers World 17 and 21, and also Avengers 34.2, which actually happens like right on the verge of time runs out. And I'd never read it. And this actually includes a lot of setup for where a lot of the outlying Avengers characters are heading into that big mess of time runs out, where we only actually get to see them on screen like for moments in the actual time runs out, including Cannonball and Sunspot. So actually it was really fun to read these for the first time when we were doing that read. And I realized I was missing a hard copy. So I just read them on Marvel Unlimited. Let's see. Um, I have Southern Cross here by Becky Cloonan. I don't know a dang thing about it. I buy these books because eventually I'm going to sit down and read them all. Becky Cloonan I did read on Punisher recently, and uh, I'm excited to read them. Maybe I won't like them. Maybe I will, but I am generally pretty positive on picking up a book from a female writer in comics because I know that generally they've had to fight a lot harder to get their work out there and it just tends to be pretty darn good and much closer to my perspective on the world. Like, I appreciate that. It's like how I joke that I don't like Jason Aaron and I don't know, like, what beard dude pocket universe he lives in. I think it's that I live in a pocket universe where there are no beard dudes. Like, I, I sometimes have some facial hair, but not in the way that Jason Aaron does. And that's fine. He's probably a very, very good person, but I don't always like, get the perspective he's coming from, and I tend to just get the perspective of female writers more, and, and queer writers too. So I try to pick them up. Uh, case in point, gosh, that's really cool. Gem and the Holograms, volume three. I don't know if you can tell, but this has a really, really cool spot varnish on the cover. This is by my fave, 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 Kelly Thompson. Uh, I've been picking them up one volume at a time whenever I need to fill out the order. This one has issues 11 through 16. I loved Gem as a kid. I had a Gem bike, even though it was pink. I was like, I don't care, I want it. I was Gem for Halloween. Uh, and a proud history of uh, cross-dressing as my favorite female characters. And so uh, I've really been having fun reading this relaunch of Gem. And there's like another four volumes, so you'll keep seeing it pop up as I complete my collection. So this is funny. I, I have so many X-Men single issues because uh, I just assumed for some things that they were never going to get reprinted. I was just going to buy the issues while I could. And then you get things like this because Domino's in a movie. Like, who would have thunk? six years ago when I bought them as individual issues. So this collects Domino's two mi uncollected miniseries, one from 1997 and one from 2003, as well as her turn in X-Force Sex and Violence, which is much more modern. It's from like the 2010 era. Uh, and then also some significant Domino appearances from X-Force and Cable Annual 95, A-plus X-10, and Uncanny X-Men Annual 2016 number one. So way, way newer than those two miniseries. But it's actually on that really nice glossy paper. 
that they do the older Marvel reprints on. And I'm totally into it. So I have it now. I don't have to figure out where to bind those issues. And the actually the um, the art is nice and crisp. Sometimes on these older comics where they have to pretty much scan them in. Oh, the first miniseries is like this. You can kind of see the page texture from the scan. Like they couldn't quite get rid of it. Or maybe it was the texture how they colored the page. This is a great example. I'm going to go in really, really tight. Do you see this little diamond pattern on the back? That's, that's picked up in a scan. I don't think that would be the pattern um, just on the page. And the way that I can tell you that is you can also kind of see it on her skin tone. And that probably wouldn't be the case in a clean art file. And that's because, you know, late 90s was like early in digital color and either they don't have the files and so they're literally rebuilding them from comics, we've talked about before on the channel, or they have the files but they're like so primitive that they're actually having to pick up some of the stuff from the original scans. I saved the best for last. This is Unstoppable Wasp. Volume 1 and 2. I buy very few post-Secret War Marvel comic books because I have Marvel Unlimited, I read them digitally, I, there's plenty of books in this house, I don't need more. I look at my big stack of like 9 or 10 boxes of Marvel now and I'm like, let's not do that again, even though I like to still read comics. But this series was so good, so charming, so... Um, pulling at the heartstrings. I read it first by myself, and then I read it with my daughter. My wife like stopped in the room as I was reading it with my daughter to pay attention, which never ever happens. It's really good comics. And at the time that it came out, pretty much everybody that I read on Twitter or whatever boards just were like, thumbs down. I One person who I really like and respect, and I don't mean to call him out, was like, I don't know if she's meant to be um, mentally not all there, but the way she talks just doesn't seem to ring true. And I read it, and I don't get that at all. I think Nadia Pym, who is the daughter of Hank Pym, uh, and his first wife, who was presumed dead before he got involved with Janet, I think she's one of the most charming comic characters that I've ever read. Jeremy Whitley does a stupendous job writing female characters and, and young female characters. Nadia is full of optimism, but she also was trained in the Red Room, the same place that the Black Widow is fun from, and she can perpetrate some major violence as a result of that. Not only that, but uh, it's a very much about girl power, and it's about uh, girls in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, and very significantly, the last two issues, issues seven and eight, um, feature Janet, the original Wasp, in one of the best turns of Janet I've ever seen, and Whitley um, writes her internal narration terrifically, better than I ever thought that Janet could be written. So I love them. I'm so happy to add them to my collection. Really, they're here to be a part of my daughter's collection, uh, and she'll get them as a gift or something, you know, eventually, so if, uh, thank you for doing well in school or something like that. So uh, I'm very, I'm sure I'm going to read them too, though. So yeah, very, very few books from post-Secret War Marvel make it through my door, but those are two. Thank you so much for sticking around for this haul around the world. I know I'm getting the books months after you did, and then you're seeing this probably another month or two after that. But did you pick up any books from this haul? Uh, are you suddenly interested in any books from this haul? Or have you read some of the ones that I haven't read and you have things to tell me that I did not know about? Please do tell me. Thank you so much for watching. This has been Haul Around the World with Crushing Comics.